So we're in the second week, uh, thanks Ish, appreciate it. Um, we're in the second week today of a series that we've entitled Culture Creators, and um, we've wanted to look at the book of 1 Corinthians. And Paul is a man who writes a, a letter to, of instruction to the church that meets in the city of Corinth, and he writes two letters to this church that, that, that are part of the scriptures, and that's why this book is called 1 Corinthians. It's the, it's the first letter in the Bible uh, that Paul wrote to the church of Corinthians. Uh, that was already meet, to the church that was already meeting in the city of Corinth. So Corinth is a city in the Mediterranean Sea in Greece. It's quite a beautiful city. And uh, it's a city that's obviously quite important to trade at the time. So as a result, it's a wealthy city. And it emphasizes luxury, comfort, and pleasure. It's also quite close to the intellectual hub of Athens. So Athens is the learning center of the day in the first century, and Corinth is quite close to that city. So the first century Corinthians pride themselves on their intellectual pursuits, how clever they are. And the city is known for its wild party life, its drunkenness, its sexual freedom. It's essentially a first century equivalent of Las Vegas without the intellectual pursuits, if you just put those aside. <clears throat> The culture that this church exists in, in the city of Corinth, is actually uh, not very different from our culture today. And the purpose of Paul writing a letter to this church, Paul has planted a church in Corinth, and then he's moved on, he's planted another church, and he hears some things, some things are going on in the church. And so he writes a letter back to this church to say, I've heard this, this, and this is happening. There's a, there's a couple of issues, and I just want to address those couple of issues. So um, he, he writes the letter uh, to address some of the issues that they're facing and to tell them how the gospel offers a response to these issues. And so the purpose of today is to take an issue that people are wrestling with and show us how the gospel responds to that issue. Rich spoke last week out of the first four chapters of this letter, and uh, the issue that, that the first four chapters address is the, is the issue of division. So Rich spoke last week about the issue of division and how the gospel offers us a response for unity, a response of unity. And so that's what Rich spoke on this week. And this week, I'm sp last week, this week, I'm speaking out of chapters 5 to 7, and the issue that Paul addresses here is sexuality, and the gospel response is sexual integrity, which is a little, little bit of a weird word, integrity. Uh, integrity just means that what I believe has been thoughtfully considered, it's been weighed up against the truth of all scripture, and then I live according to what I believe. That's what it means to have integrity. So as soon as someone says, when I'm going to speak on sexuality in and, and the church context, immediately the, the, most of the crowd is split into two. Um, half the crowd, well, some of the people in the crowd are thinking, good, he's going to hit the filthy rotten sinners with a stick. And the other half of the crowd is thinking, oh no, he's going to hit me with a stick and tell me what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> and I want to tell you that if you're in either of those categories, then I'm going to disappoint you this morning because I'm not going to do either of those things. Can you pray with me, please, as we start? Jesus, you taught us that there is a correlation between truth and freedom. You said that when we know the truth, it will set us free. When we know you, you will set us free. Thank you that you've give us, given us the Holy Spirit, who, whom you call the Spirit of truth, whom you call the one who leads us and guides us in all truth. And Holy Spirit, I pray that every word that I speak this morning that is truth would carry the power of your presence, would carry your authority, and every word that I speak this morning that is not the truth would be inconsequential. It would fade away in people's memories. It wouldn't, wouldn't enter their hearts. Only that which carries your truth would enter our hearts, would enter our minds, would carry the, the, the power of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So, a couple of key scriptures that, that Paul writes to the church in. Uh, chapter 6, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians, it says this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And the key here when it, come, when it comes to our sexuality is that we are to use our bodies to honor God. Then he writes in, um, in the next chapter, 7, verse 17, he says, Each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. Each person, in whatever situation they're in, should live as a believer. Believers, friends, believers, people that follow Jesus are called to be holy. 
And so what Paul is saying to the church here is, wherever God has called you to live, whatever he's called you to do, live holy. Live as a believer, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, live a life of holiness. And we'll get to what holiness is in a minute. In other words, the goal of your sexuality is, wholeness, is, is holiness. It doesn't matter what you think of your sexuality. It must be holy. So the Bible begins in the book of Genesis with a wedding between Adam and Eve, and then it culminates, it ends in the book of Revelation with another wedding between Christ and the church. And one of the major themes of the whole of Scripture, the whole of the Bible, is this thing of God's covenant love for His people that is expressed through marriage. That's one of the major themes of the Bible, God's covenant love for His people expressed through marriage. It begins with a wedding, and it ends with a wedding. And if, if marriage, if this covenant love is such an important thing to God, and our sexuality as humans is given to us as a major part of this covenant love, it stands to reason that it's quite important to God. This is not a peripheral issue. This is not something that we can just, ah, it's, it's the gospel is one issue and, and our sexuality is another issue. No, friends, this is actually central to covenant, covenant love, <coughs> Excuse me. which is the story of Scripture. How we think about it and what we believe about it and how we behave is important. I knew that it was going to be quiet this morning. That's why I wore a loud shirt. A man called T.D. Jakes says this, If reasonable men and women don't speak up honestly, unreasonable people take over the narrative. The world's narrative for sexuality is rooted in individualism and humanism. This is their story for making sense of our sexuality. If it feels right to you, then it's right for you. It's about the individual first and foremost. So every person in this room is aware, either consciously or subconsciously, at some level, of their own brokenness. And every person in this room is either actively or passively trying to fix that brokenness. I'm not talking only about your sexuality. I'm talking about your core identity, who you are, your life. Every person, at some level, is either aware of it or unaware of it. And, and depending on whether you are subconsciously or consciously aware of your brokenness, you will either be actively or passively trying to fix and, whole and heal that brokenness. And so people try and fix their brokenness through status and achievement, and through denial, alcoholism, hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure, through the approval of others, promiscuity, drugs, pornography, prescription medication. And the problem is that most people that try and fix their brokenness, they try and fix it with everything except the thing that actually caused their brokenness. So we're wondering, why can I not be whole? Well, because you're not addressing the root cause of your brokenness. So every time you start to patch it up, the root cause is still broken and you, and you end up broken. And again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking today about sexuality, but this applies to our lives. This is our core identity. Paul writes to the church in uh, chapter 5, in verse 12 of this letter, and he says, what business, it, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are we not to judge those inside? He says, God will judge those outside the church. Friends, we are called as the church to preach correction and repentance to the church first. That's where truth exists, and that's where truth sets people free. And Because we've often shouted without reasoning and spoke without loving to the world, we've got people that have been sexually discipled by the world and not the church. And we wonder why the unreasonable have taken over the narrative, because we have to speak hard truths to the church. First, friends, if you and I don't begin to speak up honestly about sexuality, the world will continue to dominate the narrative with its themes of individualism and humanism. And to have this conversation, church, please listen to what I'm saying. To have this conversation, we have to lower our voices. This is not a conversation to be shouting. This is a conversation with lowered voices. We, we have to adjust our tone. We have to adjust our facial expressions. We know that what we believe is important, but how we believe it is equally important. What we believe is important, but the world doesn't hear what we believe. The world hears how we believe it, which means how I believe what I believe is very important. We have to lower our voices, adjust our tone and our facial expressions. Could we love people deeply 
in the world and then confront them with truth. I think a starting point for any discussion on sin has to be our own brokenness. Did you know that acknowledging your own brokenness doesn't make you any more broken? It actually just begins a path to healing and wholeness. Paul writes to Timothy, one of the, one of the, a man that he's left in charge of a church, a young man, and he writes, he writes again a letter of instruction to him. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. He has Paul, this guy that has planted churches and left Timothy in charge of the church. And now he's writing a letter back to him. This is what you need to do. And he starts off the letter by saying, I am the chief of sinners. And he writes a letter to the Roman church. And if you know anything about um, Roman, if you've studied Roman history, you'd know that the Roman church in Rome, it exists in a time of debauchery like the world has not known. Like if, if you think today's bad, it's not. Go and study Roman history. You want, you want, if you want to understand depravity, go and look at the Roman history. And there's a church that's planted there. And Paul writes a letter to this church. And he says, the thing that I want to do is not the thing that I do. And the thing that I don't want to do, that's the thing that I do. Like I, I keep doing what I don't want to do, and I keep not doing what I want to do. He starts off with both of these letters acknowledging his own brokenness. He says, yeah, guys, guys, I want you to understand something. I'm on a path to healing and wholeness, but I'm also broken. I'm not a man who's standing over you to hit you with a stick because I'm also broken. The starting point of the narrative has to be acknowledging our own brokenness. See, I spent a, a good chunk of the first part of my life enslaved to pornography. I thought it was harmless and that I could control it, but I realized too late that I couldn't. It cost me a lot, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and I thought it would stop, and it didn't, and it almost cost me my marriage. Thank God, by His grace, it didn't, and I came out from underneath it, but I know the price that sexual brokenness will cost you. And I can promise you, it will cost you more than you can pay. It will cost you more than you're willing to pay, but it will cost you more than you are able to pay. Friends, I, I tell you that to say that what I have to say today isn't from a place of someone who is above you, who is holding a stick over you. It's from somebody who is equally broken and on a path to wholeness. Only once we recognize and acknowledge our brokenness can we begin to address and heal from it. A few weeks ago, one of my sons was playing a rugby game on the Saturday, and he came to me on the Tuesday, and he said, Dad, my elbow, doesn't, my elbow is not working. It doesn't move. So I said, what happened? Did you hit it in the rugby game? Did you, like, did you hit some? What happened? No, he says, no, I don't remember hurting it. It's, it's, it's a bit weird. But I do have this roasty, and he shows me this roasty over here that's light green in color, and it's got red lines of... Uh, of like infection going, and the red lines of infection have gone into his elbow, and now his elbow doesn't move. So I'm like, dude, you're not five. <laughs> like, what, what happened here? Talk to me, talk me through this. Why is this thing rotting? It's full of grass and sand. Why is it rotting, guy? So he says, no, I, so I, got, a, I got the roasty in the game, and then uh, I came home. I had a shower. I started to wash it. It was sore, and so I stopped washing it, um, but then it was still sore, and so I just bandaged it. I covered it up for three days. And in three days, it had begun to rot with grass and sand. And uh, his elbow was now moving, was beginning to impede his movement. And uh, long story short, at one course of antibiotics, three weeks, we, we, we had to debride it. If you know what debriding is, we had to scrub the rot, all the necrotic flesh, the rot and stuff out of it. We had to scrub it out, clean it three times a day for three weeks. And a course of antibiotics for him to learn a good lesson and me to have a good sermon illustration. See, friends, as much as we try, we can't heal brokenness with brokenness. We can't bandage over brokenness and hope that it will heal. You cannot heal your brokenness with more brokenness. Friends, what if the surgery that you are contemplating, what if the identity that you are desperately wanting to embrace, the medication that you're taking and becoming dependent on, the label that you want to give yourself and live under, the behavior that you want to engage in, isn't healing your brokenness, it's actually just covering it up and masking the rot that's happening underneath. See, Jesus says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? What will it profit you 
If you gain all the surgery that you want, if you gain all the transitions that you want, if you gain all the applause from others, if you gain all the acceptance from the world, if you gain all the sexual gratification, all of the sexual encounters that you want, if you gain all of the celebration of others, and yet you lose your soul, what will it profit you? What will you gain? You cannot heal your brokenness with further brokenness. So our sexuality has three aspects. Attraction, orientation, and behavior. Our attraction is what we find desirable. We look at something and you think, that's desirable. Our orientation is who we are consistently attracted to. Our behavior is how we act on those two desires. And so you might think that someone else is broken because their behavior offends you, but are you broken on any one of those levels? See, Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. So I ask you again, are you broken on any one of those levels? Because if you're broken on one of those levels, you are broken to varying degrees, but we're all broken. As Paul writes to the Corinthian church in in chapter 7, verse 17, the goal is to live as a believer. The goal of each of these three aspects of our sexuality is holiness. To be holy is to be set apart, to be separate and set apart from the confusion and brokenness and sinfulness of the world. To be holy is to be free from the tyranny and oppression of no truth and to live under the true freedom of God's truth. We were created in God's image, perfect, and then we are born into a broken world. We are born with broken natures and broken characteristics, broken desires, broken abilities. And only once I recognize and acknowledge this brokenness can I begin to heal from it and find wholeness. Otherwise, I'm just trying to fix my brokenness with further brokenness. How I was created perfect is far more important than how I was born broken. So remember we said that the world's narrative for sexuality is individualism and humanism. Just be yourself. Be true to yourself. It's terrible advice because the problem is if I'm being true to myself, I'm, making, I'm setting myself up as the arbiter of truth. I get to decide what truth is. And I don't know what, tr- what is true. Me. I don't have truth. To be true to myself means that I am true and I'm not. A man called John Wooden says this, being true to ourselves doesn't make us people of integrity. Charles Manson, who was a serial killer, was true to himself. And as a result, he's rightly spending the rest of his life in prison. Ultimately, being true to our creator gives us the purest form of integrity. Do you want to be at peace, friends? Do you want to be at peace? Do you want to be on a path to wholeness from the brokenness that you were born with. The most at peace you can be in any area of your life, particularly in your sexuality, but in any any area of your life, is not by pushing into an aspect of your humanity, which is subjective and broken. It's by observing God's created order. To be holy is to be free from the tyranny and oppression of no truth. And it's to live under the true freedom of God's truth. Friends, how you were created is far, far more important than how you were born. That Jesus says, don't worry about how you were born. He says, you must be born again. So I want to leave us with a few things to consider. Firstly, can we preach surrender before sanctification? Sanctification is the process of my life more accurately reflecting Christ. Sanctification is the process of me becoming more like Jesus. It's a, it's a, at, its, at its worst, sanctification is a behavior modification. And so what happens is when I preach sanctification without surrender, it's just a behavior change. Change your behavior. Whereas surrender is a heart change. And so because people's behavior offends us, we want to first change their behavior without their heart being changed. We're covering over brokenness, friends. And we're wondering why things are rotting underneath. Three days later, our elbow is not beginning to move. The way forward is for all of us to resist the temptation to force other people's behavior to a place where it no longer offends us if their heart hasn't first been transformed. 
I love what Jesus says to the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. This woman is brought before Jesus by a bunch of self-righteous people, and she's been caught in the act of adultery. And so the, the, these guys want to stone her, and they, they say to Jesus, Jesus, what do you think we should do? So Jesus says to them, uh, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. We love that part, right? If you go, if it's, don't judge me unless you're without sin, cast the first stone. They all go away. Before Jesus says to her, he says, he says two things to her. Secondly, he says, go and sin no more. Firstly, he says, where are your accusers? Are there, and she says, there are none. Then he says, I also don't condemn you. Then he says, go and sin no more. Friends, our starting point, for, for too many people's starting point is go and sin no more. Jesus' starting point is, I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. We have to preach surrender before we preach sanctification. Paul writes to the church that they're not to judge the world, but to judge the church. We have to get people to surrender to Jesus before we want to change their behavior, to become more like a God that they don't even serve. Surrender before sanctification. Secondly, order over rules. We can't approach the sexual narrative with a problem-solving mentality. Don't default to why you think a particular sexuality or masturbation or sex outside marriage is wrong and evil. Start with a holistic theology of sexuality that begins with how we are all broken, including the most spiritual-looking people. We are all broken. And it leads us to a place where we all embrace God's order for creation. I think one of the reasons that people approach the issue of sexuality with a rule book that they believe others are breaking, instead of approaching it with the order of God for his creation that begins with our own brokenness, is the desire to be seen as spiritually mature. So we think to ourselves, if I, if I can be seen as spiritually mature, then I can be with the one that holds the rule book and shows others the rules. As opposed to, if I start the narrative of God's order, God's created order always starts with my brokenness and Jesus rescuing me from my brokenness. Because we want to be seen as spiritually mature not realizing that the most spiritually mature are more aware of their brokenness and less in denial. God has a created order and an arrangement for our entire lives, which includes our sexuality. He doesn't only have a list of do's and don'ts. Sexuality must be presented through the lens of the gospel and God's grace, not through the law. And that takes time and it takes considered wise conversation. Thirdly, we need to engage long-form communication. Friends, I said it earlier, and I'll, I'll say it again. This is, this is a topic around which we have to lower our voices. Don't rely on a couple of good one-liners that you heard from someone that sounded good. Don't rely on reposting videos and memes. What we need is slow, kind, thoughtful, in-depth, nuanced conversation and debate. Tell people what you believe, absolutely. Tell them why you believe it, absolutely. And tell do both of those things with kindness. Remember, we, we want to move people out of the trap of individualism and how they were born into the freedom of how they were created. That's the goal. So rather than addressing these issues in the 190 characters that can fit into a tweet, what long-form communication allows us to do is to remove some of the shame of this conversation. See, in 190 characters on Twitter, that's, that's just a little social, social media platform that you throw out your one-liners and opinions on, that, that, that short-form communication doesn't allow any place to process shame. It just allows people to shout louder. All of us seek to avoid shame because shame is a negative emotion. And so the world tells us, don't feel shame. Don't feel shame but also don't change your heart or your behavior. The Bible calls this, trying to not feel shame, but also not changing my heart and my behavior, having a seared conscience. That's what the Bible calls it. Do you know what, when, when you see a meat, so if you, if, if, you, if you are a good South African, which you should be, all sitting here today, you should know what it means to sear meat. You, you, you take a fillet and you, you put it on a really hot fire and you burn the outside over a really hot fire so it goes hard and crispy, and on the inside is still cold and raw, like a good fillet should be. And so what happens is when, when, we, so we, when you sear something, you can't feel anything. And so because we don't want to feel shame, 
we sear our consciences. But what actually happens when we don't feel shame about things that are shameful is that we also don't feel pleasure about things that are joyful. And so we exist in this massive chasm between shame and delight, and yet we get to experience neither. We feel nothing. And the starting point of that is because we try to not feel shame without addressing our hearts and our behavior. For us to feel, for us to experience true freedom and joy, we must know what shame is. Don't take pride in shameful things. You can't remove shame without changing a heart. But likewise, don't live in shame. If your heart has changed, but one of the aspects of your life is in the slow process of change, you need to live free from shame. Do you know that Jesus spends around 30 years preparing himself quietly and in obscurity? We, we get a very, very little instruction about Jesus' first 30 years of life. We get a snapshot here and a snapshot there, and the rest of his 30 years, we don't know. And then he, has, he spends three years preaching the truth to people to set them free. Friends, could it be that Jesus spends 30 years loving people and three years preaching truth to them so that they can be set free? Could it be? Unthoughtful and unconsidered dismissal of something is equally dangerous and damaging as unthoughtful and unconsidered acceptance of something. So not being reasoned and rational and just, and just dismissing something is as dangerous as, as not being reasoned and rational and just accepting something, which none of us do, right? We hate that. Yet we, we so quickly dismiss and, and, and don't give thought to things. We, it's equally damaging, friends. We have to be comfortable not living on one-liners, but thinking holistically and over a long period of time. Our sexuality is a spiritual activity, and we have to be comfortable to address it openly, honestly, and over long form, instead of just throwing before throwing opinions at people. Lastly, number four, there is a way for you to be holy. There is a way for you to be holy. Jesus' character is absolute truth and perfect love. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and God is love. His character is absolute truth and perfect love. And so the, the, the question is always, how can we preach the truth in love without compromising truth or love? If Jesus is both of those things, it must be possible. Paul's instruction to the Corinthian church is uh, be holy. Let your sexu in your sexuality be holy. So if I need to preach the truth in love and be holy, how do I do all three of those things? I think the key, the simple, simple key is humility. Humility towards God keeps me grounded in truth because I recognize that I'm not a source of truth. He is. I'm humble enough before God not to assume that I know what the truth is. Humility towards others keeps me grounded in love. Paul writes to the Philippian church, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, and he says, In humility, consider others. I think one of the things that's missing from this conversation is, in humility, considering others. Humility, when approaching the issue of my sexuality, will lead me towards holiness. I am more than my feelings. I am more than my experiences. I am more than my thoughts. I am more than my desires and instincts. Holiness, to be free from the tyranny and oppression of no truth and to live under the true freedom of God's truth is available to me and to you. If I approach God with humility, if I approach others with humility, and if I approach my sexuality with humility. Paul writes another letter to the Roman church and he says in, Chapter 9, verse 19 of Romans. Who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? I don't know if you've ever looked at yourself and wished there was something different about you. I have. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> but I have. Friends, I don't know why some people are born with blue eyes and not brown eyes. I don't know why some people's noses are too small. Why some people's ears are too big. I don't know why my voice isn't in a deeper register so that I could record better. I don't know why some people's hips are too big and others are too small to bear children. I don't know why some people are born with physical and mental defects. And I don't know why some people are born with an aspect of their sexuality differently broken to others. What I do know 
is that if I can stay humble and not full of pride, I might not get all the answers, but it's possible for me to be holy. Paul writes to the Corinthian church that we are to honor God with our bodies and that we are to be holy. What is our position on human sexuality? It's quite broad, but it can be summed up in this. Honor God with your body. Let all of your life, including your sexuality, be holy and live under the freedom of the created order of God. Friends, if you are struggling with an issue in your sexuality, we would love to help you find healing and wholeness, whatever the issue it is, whether it's big or small. Speak to a life group leader. Get hold of us at the church. Send us a WhatsApp or an email. Get hold of us. We want to put you in, someone, put you in touch with someone who can disciple you and help you to order your sexuality. We have Project Exodus, which helps people who are stuck under the power of a, a sinful addiction find true freedom, freedom under God's created order. I want to leave you with just four resources uh, before Rich comes and we do communion. There's, uh, there's three books and one podcast. If you're wanting to understand a little bit more about holiness, God's created order, and how this can be a long-form communication, how you can understand a little bit more and be able to have reasonable and nuanced conversations. If this is to be a lowered voice conversation, if, this is to be, if, if, if the issue of sexuality is to be with lowered voices and in long form and to be reasonable, we, ha- we have to equip ourselves to understand a little bit more about it. Because the less I know, the more likely I am to throw out a one-liner. The less I know, the more uncomfortable I'll be to speak on it. Can we equip ourselves? Again, there's there's, there's a couple of resources there, but come and speak. Come and speak to someone. If you are struggling, come and speak to someone. Please.